You've got to know that the limit of sine theta over theta as theta approaches zero is one. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson proving this limit. Today, we're going to evaluate these four additional trig limits, which will all require us to use the well-known sine theta over theta as theta approaches zero limit. After we go over these, I'll give you a few more bonus problems to try at the end. Let's get into it. Beginning with problem one, the limit of cosine x minus 1 over x as x approaches 0. This limit is very typically done right after establishing this limit. So this is another classic, you might say. This is a situation where you should recognize the value of the conjugate. The conjugate is something that we can use when we have a sum or difference of terms. In this case, we have cosine x minus 1, and we would rather have the difference of their squares. If we had cosine squared minus 1 squared, which is just cosine squared minus 1, we could use the Pythagorean identity to substitute in sine squared. So let's use the conjugate. The conjugate of cosine x minus 1 is cosine x plus 1. So we're going to multiply the numerator by cosine x plus 1 in order to get a difference of squares up here. And then, of course, we have to multiply the denominator by cosine x plus 1 as well. That way, it's just like we're multiplying by 1, and we haven't changed the limit. Now, you don't really have to go through this multiplication in the numerator. If you're familiar with the idea of a conjugate, you know this is going to give us a difference of squares, but I will show you the multiplication just in case. In the denominator, of course, we just have x times cosine x plus 1. This is something to keep in mind when you're evaluating limits. It's really the numerator that we're trying to change here. The whole point was to get the difference of squares in the numerator by using the conjugate. We didn't really want to change the denominator, and so we shouldn't distribute. Let's just leave it in its factored form, and if we decide we want to distribute later, we can. But oftentimes, leaving stuff in its factored form will be useful for limits because it allows us to see potential places for cancellation or potential ways that we might split the limit up into a product of limits that we already know. Now in the numerator, doing our distribution, we have cosine times cosine, which gives us cosine squared. Then we have minus one times cosine, which gives us minus cosine. We also have cosine times one, giving us plus cosine, and negative one times one, giving us minus one. Of course, these two cosines in the middle are minus and plus, so they'll cancel out. When they cancel out, we'll just be left with cosine squared minus one. And if we pull a negative one out of that, that will give us negative one minus cosine squared. You can see if we distributed this negative back into the parentheses, we would get positive cosine squared and negative one. So this is just a different way of writing it. Of course, we write it this way to see how we can apply the Pythagorean identity. The Pythagorean identity says that sine squared x plus cosine squared x is equal to one. And what we have here is one minus cosine squared x. We see that the Pythagorean identity tells us sine squared x equals one minus cosine squared x. So this one minus cosine squared x will now replace with sine squared. And that gets us here. We still have that negative, the parentheses we replaced with sine squared x using the Pythagorean identity. And now we're almost done. Notice that this is sine squared. It's two factors of sine. We can take one factor of sine and pair it up with this x in the denominator. That way, we'll have the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. And we know what that is, of course. All that leaves is the negative, as well as the second factor of sine, with cosine x plus one in the denominator. You can see how it was the right choice to leave the denominator in factored form. We were able to pull out that x to pair up with one factor of sine x, and then that just leaves this. So we have the limit of this times this, and of course we can split that up into the product of the individual limits. On the left, the limit of sine x over x we know is 
1. On the right, we can evaluate this by simple substitution. Plugging 0 in to sine x gives us just 0, so that's negative 0, which is just 0 in the numerator. And the denominator, well, cosine of 0 is 1, so it's 1 plus 1. In the end, it's just 0, and so it's 1 times 0 for a final limit, and thus our answer is zero. Again, this is a classic limit that just like sine theta over theta as theta approaches zero, you might want to memorize. Let's move on to problem two. This is a basic limit problem where you want to use the sine theta over theta limit. We want to evaluate the limit of sine of seven theta over four theta as theta approaches zero. Now in our famous well-known limit, the input of sine theta matches the denominator, which is also theta. So in this problem, in order to make sense of it, we want the denominator to match the input of sine. Now it's not so easy to get inside the sine function and change the input. That's not a very basic thing to do. It's a lot easier to change our denominator. So our goal here is to make the denominator match the input. We want to make the denominator 7 theta so that we can apply our well-known trig limit. Right now, of course, there is a 4 in the denominator, but that's not a big deal. We can just slide that right out of the limit. That's perfectly valid. And we can just put a 7 in the denominator as long as we multiply by 7 outside of the limit. So all we did was pull out that 4 from the denominator. We multiplied by 7 and we divided by seven. So in the end, we didn't change anything. We've just rewritten the limit in a way that we prefer. Now we just have to notice that although our input seven theta is not the thing that's approaching zero in our limit, theta approaching zero is the same as seven theta approaching zero. So that really is what's happening here. The input seven theta is approaching zero because theta is approaching zero. So this is the same as seven fourths times the limit as seven theta approaches zero. And now of course we can apply our known limit. We have sine of a thing over a thing with that thing approaching zero. Sine of seven theta over seven theta, and seven theta is approaching zero. We know seven theta is approaching zero because theta was approaching zero originally. So certainly seven theta is approaching zero. And this limit we know is one. Sine of a thing over a thing as the thing approaches zero, that limit is one. And so our final answer is just seven fourths times one, which of course is seven fourths. Problem three is the limit of a times cotangent a as a approaches zero. Now, if you're not sure where to start with a trig limit, it's often a good idea to put everything in terms of sines and cosines. That can make it easier to see potential identities, familiar limits, and places where there might be cancellation or just different ways you might be able to rewrite the limit. So let's rewrite this. Cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So cotangent, you may recall, is cosine over sine. So this is the limit as a approaches zero of a times cosine a all over sine a. Now you should notice that we have an a over sine a, which should make you think about trying to get our limit sine a over a with a approaching zero involved in this problem. And we can do that very easily in fact by just dividing the numerator by a, which will cancel out that factor of a, and dividing the denominator by a. And then we'll have sine a over a with a approaching zero. That might help us simplify the limit in a way that can get us to the solution. So dividing the numerator and denominator by a, that factor of a cancels out, leaving just cosine a in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have sine a over a. Now we can rewrite this limit. The limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, provided that they exist and the denominator is non-zero. So we can now evaluate the limit of the numerator, cosine a, as a approaches zero, divided by the limit of the denominator as a approaches zero. 
And this is very easy. The limit in the denominator, we know, is 1. Sine A over A as A approaches 0. That's 1. In the numerator, we can just plug 0 in. Cosine of 0 is 1. And so finally, we see our answer is 1 over 1, which is 1. The final problem we'll solve in this video is the limit as y approaches 0 of sine y over sine pi y. You might think about applying the strategy we just used. We could divide the numerator by y, which would force us to also divide the denominator by y. In that case, the numerator we can see is approaching 1, sine y over y, and the denominator we could solve with just a little bit more work. To evaluate the denominator, we would want to divide it also by a factor of pi, so the input matches the denominator. In that case, we'd have to divide the numerator by pi as well, so that it's like we're still just multiplying or dividing by 1. In total, then, let's just divide the numerator and denominator by pi y. When we do that, this is what we get. In the numerator, we have sine y over pi y, and in the denominator, we have sine pi y over pi y. Now in the numerator, we don't really want that pi that's getting divided by, so let's just slide that out. So in the numerator now, we have 1 over pi, and let's evaluate these limits individually. The limit of the numerator, sine y over y, and the limit of the denominator, sine pi y over pi y. Now of course, we have y approaching 0, but that's the same as pi y approaching 0. So now we have totally rewritten this limit as 1 over pi times the limit as y approaches 0 of sine y over y. This part, of course, we know is 1. And then in the denominator, we have the limit as pi y approaches 0, since that's the same as y approaching 0. And this is the limit of sine pi y over pi y. Again, all we did was divide the numerator and denominator by pi y, and then do some basic rewriting. Finally, evaluating everything here, like we said, this part in the numerator is 1. So the numerator is just 1 over pi times 1. In the denominator, we have sine of a thing over the thing as the thing approaches 0. We know that's 1. So the limit is 1 over pi times 1 divided by 1, which of course is 1 over pi. And those are a few examples of how you can use this classic trig limit to solve other trigonometric limits. And here are three more limits you can try evaluating that will also require you to use that famous sine x over x limit. Please also consider becoming a channel member to help support Wrath of Math and get access to six total additional problems. You'll get to see these three that I've covered up as well as the full solutions. So for channel members, I'll see you there for these six more limits. And whoever you are, be sure to check out my Calculus One course and Calculus One exercises playlists for more. Links in the description. Thanks for watching.